Great. Uh, so good morning and happy Juneteenth Day. Uh, and this is the first episode of The Extraordinary Wildlife in Your Backyard that does not feature a bird or a mammal. This is uh, episode nine. You say potato bug, I say roly poly. Uh, every week I feature one of the great activities in the UEC in my backyard website, uh, again, for people of all ages. And I realized that I never actually watched personally the introductory video to the website given by Ken Leinbach, the executive director. And actually it was, I appreciated that. And so we're just gonna listen to that quickly together. Again, you may have to adjust your volume. Hello everyone, my name is Ken Leinbach and I am the executive director of the Urban Ecology Center. And I couldn't be more pleased and proud of my dynamic team at the Urban Ecology Center has put together a virtual platform called Urban Ecology Center in my backyard. Now, everyone's backyard is different. I'm actually standing in your backyard, our backyard, because this is public land along the Milwaukee River. Don't hear anything. Believe it or not, there's over 100,000 people that live within one mile of this site. So this is one version of a backyard. Yours might be the vacant lot next door, could be the park nearby, or you might even be fortunate enough to have your own backyard. We think of it all as one. You'll see three different things. You'll see the backyard classroom where you can learn all sorts of dynamic activities that you can do with your kids and do it on your own. It's really cool. Uh, you can also do um, my backyard research where you're engaging in exciting research with the, with the studies that you're doing, be it phenology, looking for birds, and then uh, collecting that data and using it in different ways that we can engage you with, right? And then the final one is My Backyard Adventures. That's actually my favorite because a lot of folks on my team are having fun going off on virtual walks that you can go along with them or bird, bird guides or uh, you know tree identification, that type of thing. It's, it's really cool. So check out the site. Uh, we, we hope you, you, you use it. And of course, the goal is to get outside. And remember, you can get out every day. There's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. So we encourage you to do this every day uh, that you're with us. So um, thanks. And remember, we're all one in this. Bye-bye. No such thing as bad weather. Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Line. Only bad clothes. I like that. All right, so back to our so it's a little bit outdated since that came out actually a couple months ago, but again, I think that's a good introduction to the website. Um, and I, so I also just gave a talk uh, to employees at Baird as part of their, what they call the Be Wellness employee program. Uh, and I'm, I'm really glad that they recognize the importance of physical and mental health with their employees. Um, and I began my talk with a short list of the health benefits of just being outside uh, that has research backing up the premise. Um, it's, it, it's easier to connect the dots between outdoor activities such as running, kayaking, and rock climbing with physical health. Uh, and we probably have an idea that just being outside helps our emotional health, but I mean, we could do an entire talk just on the many health benefits that being outside uh, gives us. So here's one list compiled by the folks over at Mental Floss, one of my favorite magazines that's no longer in print, but it's still uh, virtual. And uh, again, each of these points is supported by medical science. So first, being outside boosts your energy. Uh, there's a, a study that suggests that even 20 minutes outside gives your brain an energy boost comparable to a cup of coffee. Two, it feels easier to exercise outdoors. In this study, they put people on a, on a stationary bike and they surrounded them with the color green, gray, or red in video footage. And, and those that had just the color green around them uh, for the same workout had, had feelings of less physic physical exertion and more positive moods. The outdoors is good for your vision. Elementary students who spend more time outside are less likely uh, to become nearsighted. Natural sunlight helps mitigate pain. Surgery patients who were exposed to sunlight reported less stress and marginally less pain and therefore took less pain medication. The outdoors boosts your immune system. There are certain chemicals produced by plants that increase our levels of white blood cells and help us fight off infections and diseases. The outdoors provides you with free aromatherapy. 
uh, research shows that natural scents like roses and freshly cut grass and pine make you feel calmer and more relaxed. The outdoors enhances creativity. Psychologists found that backpackers scored 50% higher in creativity tests after spending a few days in the wild without electronics. The outdoor helps with seasonal affective disorder. Uh, doctors say spending time outside can lessen the severity of SAD even if it's cold and cloudy. Being outdoors gives you your daily dose of vitamin D. We get more than 90% of our vitamin D from sunlight. Uh, and there are all kinds of benefits related to vitamin D. The outdoors restores your focus. So even if you just take a few minutes uh, and leave the office and, and go outside, um, that helps. And finally, the outdoors makes us better people. According to psychologists, exposure to nature helps us shrug off societal pressures, stresses, and allows us to remember and value more important things like relationships, sharing, and community so all right um my first challenge in the talk about the roly-poly was you know all of the different names that we are talking about and and uh just to kind of figure out when we mention those names what do they mean are they talking about the same thing uh are they talking to the groups and uh so the, the ones that we mentioned roly-poly pill bug sow bug potato bug uh so i'm going to stick with roly-poly for now um, as we sort this all out and and sometimes with some of these species lately I've been kind of skipping over the family tree the tree of life part But I think this time we definitely need it. So the first step is easy uh, Roly-polies like everything else are still animals. So we'll start with the, the they're in the animal kingdom uh, But right from here, we're gonna venture down a new path in the phylum category So normally we kind of take that upper left corner with the chordates the, the animals with backbone and this time we're gonna take a right at that big fork and go all the way to the top to visit the phylum arthropoda, the arthropods. Uh, the, name arthrop the name arthropod is derived from Greek. It means jointed foot. Uh, arthropods are invertebrates, meaning they don't have a backbone or any kind of internal skeleton. Instead, they have an exoskeleton or an external skeleton. Uh, their protective structure lies on the outside of the body in, in some kind of rigid material or a shell. So here are all examples of animals with exoskeletons. Not all of them are arthropods, but these are all exoskeletons. So the cockroach and the crab are arthropods and the snail and the nautilus are, are mollusks, a different group of animals. And turtles uh, are both, they're vertebrates, they're, uh, but they, both, they have both an endoskeleton in the form of their shell and an exoskeleton. I'm sorry, an endoskeleton in form of their bones internally, and then they have that exoskeleton shell, which is really kind of the fused bones. Um, arthropods, arthropods uh, in addition to having this exoskeleton, have segmented bodies and jointed paired appendages with bilateral symmetry. So the exoskeleton is made of chitin, which is rigid. So in order to grow, Arthropods must periodically molt their old skin. So they shed their former skin for a new one and initially it's soft and then it expands and becomes a bigger uh, exoskeleton. There are over a million described arthropods, which makes up more than 80% of all described animal species. And they range from microscopic organisms to the Japanese spider crab, the largest. And inside that exoskeleton, exoskeleton. Uh, their organs rest in kind of this open circulatory system of hemolymph. They have a, a rudimentary heart that's more like a pumping vessel and the hemolymph provides a similar function, function to what our blood uh, provides us. Uh, the arthropod phylum is then further divided into five subphyla into five different groups. Uh, the first one is the extinct trilobites. Uh, which is maybe the one group of organisms I'd love to travel back in time to see. Um, maybe after the dinosaurs and the giant sloths. So then definitely trial, uh, trilobites. Um, another major group is the glycerates, which includes spiders and mites and scorpions and the trilobite-like horseshoe crab. You have myriapods, which includes millipedes and centipedes. 
You have crustaceans, which include lobsters, crabs, and shrimp, and then the hexapods, the six feet, hexa six podas feet, which includes the insects. So these are the five groups of arthropods, the five major groups. And the roller poly moves in with the mostly aquatic crustaceans. That's the roly poly is one of the only group of terrestrial, fully terrestrial crustaceans. Crustaceans are further divided into six classes, four of them are shown here, and the roly poly follows the familiar, the crabs, the lobsters, the crayfish, and the shrimp into the class Melacostraca, which is the largest class of crustaceans. They have about 40,000 living described species, and they all share a common body plan comprising 20, usually 20 body segments. Uh, for some, there's a couple fews into 19, and for couple there's 21, but almost all of them have 20 body segments. And like insects, they're divided into head, thorax, and an abdomen. There are a couple of further classifications, subclass, and superorder, but let's we'll just jump straight into the order isopod. And now we kind of functionally have the level of detail that we need. So when I posted on Facebook yesterday the question, what do you call these animals? Uh, one of them from my, my grad school friend Andy Bieberick posted isopods, and that's one of the things that I call this group isopods. Um, another name that you may have heard of is the wood lice, uh, which I, I think mainly because we associate lice with ickiness, maybe it's not the most flattering of names, but incidentally, wood lice are not at all related to the head lice, which are actually six legged parasitic insects. Um, and uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of marine and terrestrial isopods, and our roly-poly is in the family, and, and I just I love how appropriate this name is. The family is Armadillidiidae. Say it with me. Armadillidiidae. I challenge everybody to say that in a sentence sometime before next week's talk to somebody that hasn't seen this talk. So the Armadillidiidae are terrestrial isopods that share the trait that they can roll into a ball, like their mammal namesake, the armadillo. And it's this trait of rolling into a ball, also known as conglobulation. There's your word of the day. No, no, armadillo diet is your, definitely your word of the day, but the, the process of conglobulation is what gives it the name pill bug or roly poly. Um, other common names given to this group are slaters and doodle bugs. And surprisingly, pill bugs are not native to the Americas. They, like many species we've been talking about in, these, uh, in the series, were introduced. And we'll get into that a little bit more uh, later. So we make it to species. And the species that we find hiding in our backyards and basements is the common pill bug also known as Armadillidium vulgare. That's just an awesome name. Um, vulgare, of course, means common, just like we had in the common starling talk, sternus vulgaris, uh, common, vulgar. So this is the common pill bug. And the term bug, the term bug is usually, it usually refers to kind of anything that's small and creepy and crawly in our vernacular, uh, vernacular and uh, although there is an order of insects called the true bugs, but for all intents and purposes, a bug is just anything that's kind of small and creepy and crawly, kind of separate from the scientific name. Um, uh, I should point out that there is another group, a group of invertebrates called the pill millipedes, which can also roll into a ball uh, but they're in an entirely different class there with the other millipedes and centipedes. Okay, so in addition to all the names we've mentioned so far, I think we've got wood lice, isopods, roly polies, pill bugs, I mentioned slaters and doodle bugs. The common bill, pill bug also sometimes bears the name potato bug, pill, wood louse, wood shrimp, carpenter, and one of the features of the common pill bug in contrast with other species of pill bugs is that when the common pill bug rolls into a ball, that ball is airtight. You can't get through it. You can't find a single gap. Um, with most of the other species, there is a small gap um, in, in imperfection. And, uh, and of course, the whole point of rolling into a ball is for protection. 
of the, the softer, more breakable underparts uh, underneath a ball of tougher armor. Uh, but there is a second reason for rolling into a tight ball. And I'm going to let the folks over at PBS uh, explain this one a little bit better. Um, here we go. Bugs, roly polies, potato bugs, whatever you want to call them, somehow there's something less creepy about these guys than other insects. More lovable or something. Maybe it's because they're not insects at all. Pill bugs are actually crustaceans, they're more closely related to shrimp and lobsters than crickets or beetles. Pill bugs even taste like shellfish if you cook them right. Some adventurous foragers call them wood shrimp. As early as 300 million years ago, some intrepid ancestor crawled out of the ocean, sensing there might be more to eat or less competition on dry land. But unlike lobsters, pill bugs can roll up into a perfect little ball for protection. If you look closely, you can see the evidence of where these guys came from. Like their ocean-dwelling cousins, pill bugs still use gills to breathe. True insects, like this cricket, use a totally different system. See those tiny holes on this cricket's abdomen? They're called spiracles. They lead to a series of tubes that bring fresh air directly to the insect's cells. But pill bugs don't have any of that. To survive on land, they had to adapt. Their gills, called pleopods, are modified to work in air. Folds in the pleopod gills developed into hollow branched structures, almost like tiny lungs. In a way, the pill bug is only halfway to becoming a true land animal, because they're still gills. They need to be kept moist in order to work, which is why you usually find pill bugs in moist places. Like under damp, rotting logs. They can't venture too far away. Sure, pill bugs look like the most ordinary of bugs, but they're much more than that. Evidence that over evolutionary time, species make big, life-changing leaps. And those stories are written on their bodies. Hey, while we're on the subject of oddball crustaceans, check out this episode about mantis shrimp. Their eyes see colors we can't even comprehend. Their punch is faster than Muhammad Ali's. And while we have you, subscribe, okay? Thank you, and see you next time. Too bad those mantis shrimp don't live in our yards. That would be a fun one. Um, so, like the video explains, having evolved from sea creatures, they still retain those primitive gills that work in the air. And, and, and a few of you pointed out at the beginning of this talk that you usually see them in damp areas under things. And that's because they, they still require damp areas for those air breathing gills to work. Um, so if they do enter your home, and, and pill bugs are, are explorers, they'll, they'll explore their areas and, and uh, they can kind of, that exoskeleton helps retain that moisture for a while. Um, and, and so they will, they'll get into your home and hopefully they'll work their way downstairs to the basement where there might be enough moisture to keep them alive. But I remember as a kid sometimes finding pill bugs like on the windowsill, uh, which was a bit of bad luck for them because they, they, do, they do like sunlight to get their body temperature up, but unfortunately there wasn't enough moisture there and, and, uh, and so 
you see them kind of desiccated and and they're in that rolled up position because that's what they revert to to try to survive if it does get too dry um, and then unfortunately uh, that's kind of a last resort resort um, but but even among the pill bug group the common pill bug uh, that's that's uh, in our area um, is it's a little more tolerant of dry conditions so that's again allows it to venture into your house a little bit um, okay uh, pill bugs are are less than an inch long and some of you are wondering about their role in the ecosystem there they primarily eat decaying plant matter so they provide a really important decomposer function in an ecosystem um, they will also forage on, on living lichens and algae, uh, so they're, they're herbivorous uh, and, and they, I mean, um, omnivorous, uh, eating plants and animals, and they, they find on, on tree bark, uh, th things that they'll run across on tree bark or your house, they'll just kind of scavenge whatever's there. Um, and they're native across Europe including the UK, but they're way more common in Southern Europe where temperatures are a little more tolerable. Um, in fact, their temperature tolerance, tolerance is very similar to ours. They, they don't do well below freezing and they don't do well above about 90 degrees. Uh, again, as long as there's moisture, they're, they're okay. Um, the common pill bug has, has been introduced many times in North America and other parts of the world, uh, but they're quite common here and especially along the West Coast. Uh, there are some areas where the pill bugs in this, you know, in a square foot, you'll find a thousand individuals uh, in a square foot, particularly along the west coast, California, um, and some of the humid rainforests. Um, the relationship of pill bugs with humans is is likely dependent on your age. So kids will often keep them as pets, and if if well maintained, they can live up to three years as a pet with the right conditions. And I found out that there is a pill bug pet industry where hobbyists breed them for color variations like this Punta Cana variety from what this website says, the MT Pet Emporium. And word on the street is the best way to catch a bunch of pill bugs is to put a half a cantaloupe outside on the ground upside down. But I, I think most adults, I think look at them mostly as, as harmless home pests. If you, but if you go to the Pest control websites, pill bugs and sow bugs are included in, you know, how to get rid of them. Another super interesting pill bug fact that I certainly didn't know about, and guess, guess very few of us know, is that roly-poly females are devoted mothers. Uh, they carry first their eggs and then the embryos in a brood pouch on the ventral side of their body. And they can produce two to two dozen young per brood, and they'll have two or three broods per year. So this, this pouch, this marsupial-like pouch can actually hold up to 100 young at a time. And the immature isopod can remain in that pouch for like two months. Uh, so devoted mothers, young pill bugs just look smaller. They're just kind of smaller, paler version of their parents. And I, I don't know, they're pretty cute. Um, while we're on the subject, some isopods can reproduce through parthenogenesis. So just like honeybees, if, if they produce unfertilized eggs, They'll be clones of mom and they'll always hatch as females. Uh, producing exact clones of yourself is a beneficial adaptation, particularly when the environment is stable and you're doing well. You kind of want your offspring to have the same genetic makeup. Sexual reproduction, which they also do, produces new genetic combinations and that's useful if the environment is changing or when the environment isn't particularly suitable at that moment, then you can produce new combinations of genetics to deal with uh, the environment. Do you have a, a few kind of fast facts that, uh, you know, this is where I was kind of going into some, some websites I don't normally visit, so I don't, they're not all fact checked, but, but I had to find them at least in a few different places. But like rabbits, roly polies are coprophagous, meaning they eat their own poop to replenish lost vital minerals. Uh, but unlike rabbits, they can also obtain moisture from the environment through their rear end. They don't urinate. Instead, they release an ammonia gas as a, as a waste product. And there is a certain bacteria in the environment that can turn a male roly-poly into a female one. 
So these are all adaptations you do find in various places throughout the animal kingdom because, you know, after millions and millions of years of evolution, there's some crazy things that happen. Um, they communicate to other individuals through vibrational communication like many insects do, and they use those antenna uh, for, for listening and, and talking. And another defense besides rolling up is they emit a foul smelling odor. So now we're gonna uh, make a shift to The Call Last Night with author John Haynes, um, who of course wrote that excellent book called Nature Underfoot, living with beetles, crabgrass, fruit flies, and other tiny life around us. For me, the timing of this, of reading this book couldn't have, couldn't have been better. So uh, I think it was a week ago we were on this call and, and, and made the decision to feature roly polies. And, and a lot of you like that. And, and then literally about an hour later, I picked up John's book to start reading it. It's a great read. It, it, it's a, you, can, you can do it in a few days. Um, whoops. And the first critter that he mentions is the roly-poly. So that was a, a bit of serendipity. And, and in the beginning of the book, he conjures up an image from my childhood, uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon. So I love this film. I love to be scared by this film. I'm, I'm pretty sure my first real nightmares involve this creature, the Gill Man. Um, but both, both John Haynes and myself saw the connection between the Gill Man in the film and the Roly Poly, uh, maybe because of those armored belly plates. It's probably modeled after this, this body type and, and, and they also have those external gills. And for me, that connection also included the trilobites. And I, I, a quick aside, I also remember one of the films being broadcast in 3D over one of the network uh, stations and you had, to, you had to pick up these 3D glasses, um, probably like some participating stores had them and, and then before the, the film ran, when you turned on the TV, they gave you instructions on how to adjust your TV set to make the TV work with the glasses. Anyway, that's uh, neither here nor there, but but John Haynes goes on further to bring uh, in a more recent film called The Shape of Water, which I still haven't seen uh, by Guillermo del Toro, uh, who was inspired when he made this film, he was inspired by his memory of watching the creature from the Black Lagoon as a kid. And in both The Creature and The Shape of Water, there's this gill man. And also in both films, there's this love interest. And the, the gill man develops feelings uh, in the creature from the Black Lagoon for a woman who's on the expedition and and then the amphibian man in the shape water develops an interest for a cleaning lady and according to del Toro he he wanted to further explore that relationship that was introduced in the original creature movie uh, the, the kind of human relationships and so in the shape of the wa shape of water the love interest is, is mutual and this all ties into John Haynes's book because the book features a lot of species that don't get a lot of love in real life. And um, John, he kind of waxes poetic about these creatures and their behaviors and hopefully tries to nurture a respect for these living creatures through an understanding. Uh, he, he argues that we have a moral responsibility to value life in all its forms. And he even, you know, takes, takes that into the human realm. And, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. It's, it's one of my motivations for doing these weekly chats to, to help us better understand our neighbors and our properties and in our neighborhood. A, a, a deeper understanding allows for a deeper appreciation of both the beauty in our neighborhood and the connections that we have with species we may either choose to ignore or want to get rid of. The, the discussion last night was fascinating because it moved into concepts like plant blindness and, uh, and Robin mentioned the reduction of the reduction of the complexity of our language if we understand less about nature. And so in the, in the two creature films, they, they build this sense of empathy for the creatures, um, which from a morality perspective is important. Uh, in the creature, uh, we, we, we go to, into, into its territory and try to capture him and, and put him on display. And the same thing I, I think happens uh, in, in the shape of water. And so, it's just, it's developing this empathy for things that we're afraid of. Uh, so in any case, I encourage you to read John's book. And, and I also know that it's provided me some inspiration for some future topics on, uh, here. But 
back to our topic at hand, John also talks about how as a kid, he would prod roly polies so he could watch them roll into a ball. But for some reason, there were certain roly polies that never rolled up into a ball, no, no matter how hard he prodded them. And he later learned the reason. Uh, he was prodding a different species, and this also helps with all of our names. The sow bug is actually a different species from the pill bug. And guess what? Sow bugs don't roll up into balls for defense the way pill bugs do. So uh, he was prodding and prodding and felt bad about it afterwards. But, uh, but that, that was a learning experience for me um, because I thought they were interchangeable. But sow bugs are identified by those two appendages coming out of the rear plate, which you don't find in the pill bug. Um, so we can add sow bug as a new species and a new name. And then again on Facebook, I asked people what they call these critters. So now we have a lot more to add to the list. So reviewing what we have so far, we have sow bugs, potato bugs, pill bugs, wood louse, wood shrimp, carpenter, isopod, roly poly, slater, doodle bug. On Facebook, CC's friend Emerson calls them really polies. Carlos uh, in, says in Mexico, they call them puerquitos or little pigs. My friend Zach has, I, I think my favorite, he calls them bowling ball bugs. But then Pat Bojit, who works, who worked with Extension, she just recently retired, she provided an entire list of names along with the regions where they originated, which is super cool. So uh, this is, you know, kind of this global connection now to this to the same critter, uh, and and so now you add things like Gramer sows, Grampers, Butchie boys, boat builders, chisel bobs, wood pigs, timber pigs, monkey peas, pea balls. Pishahamares, tomato bugs, chuggy pigs, chuggy pegs, chucky pigs, crunchy bats, wood bugs, granny grays, billy buttons, and parson pigs. Bit out of control, but I love it. Also on Facebook, a discussion started on what pill bugs might taste like. And my friend Andy said he wondered if the giant marine species are tasty. Could be a, a future source of protein. Then my friend Ananda chimed in that she had heard on NPR that the small one tastes like urine which might have to do with that defense mechanism the, uh, or, or just how it urinates through a, a gas, as we mentioned above. But anyway, uh, I just love confusion. And, and to add to the confusion, there's a tree in Australia, a toy, a British pudding, a sandwich shop, um, several songs and games, a gymnastic maneuver, champion racehorse, lots of books, TV shows and movies, and a dancing troupe called, all called Roly Poly in some form or another. And to finish it off, we have a cartoon character called Roly Polioli, and then not to be outdone, Wayne Shaw is a professional soccer player who went by the nickname the Roly Poly Goalie. Um, so I am going to end the talk with a reading from John Haynes's book that I think is a great way to sum up today. He had just talked about the, the two movies. He says, uh, happily, we don't have to look far for armored creatures with a gill-like breathing apparatus. We can find them roaming our homes. They are pill bugs and their relatives, the sow bugs. They get around on seven pairs of legs and are small, maybe half an inch in length. So a love affair of the sort depicted in the shape of water is not likely with a pill bug, but as I will suggest, affection for these creatures and other tiny organisms that intersect our lives is definitely possible. Scientists refer to animals like pill bugs and sow bugs as isopods, kind of crustacean, the group of animals that also contain shrimp and crabs. The isopods originally lived only in water, but more than 50 million years ago, some began to move to dry land. The gill-like breathing organ is a vestige of their aquatic origins. Unsurprisingly, given their ancestry, pill bugs require most conditions to survive, and they're often found under stones, logs, and leaf litter. Our basements may provide sufficient humidity for bill bugs when they venture indoors. Most other parts of our homes though, are generally too dry for pill bugs to survive. As a result, many of us have witnessed the sad scene in which dead curled up pill bugs litter the floor. People, people often react to the presence of pill bugs by using a vacuum to remove them, whether dead or alive. Yet gently returning live pill bugs to a suitably moist place outdoors is doing the environment a favor. They are great recyclers and important decomposers of dead leaves. They help ensure that we are not knee deep in leaf litter and that the soil is replenished with nutrients. There is definitely something to love about these armored creatures whose ancestors emerged from a black lagoon 50 million years ago to take up life on land. 
So that is the end of today's talk and I'm going to stop sharing my screen.